the story we know. The king of kings born in a lowly manger. But the story we know is part of a bigger story. A story that unfolds not just in a stable, but on the stage of history played out among the stars in the heavenly host. It's a story of cosmic conflict, of good and evil locked in battle, of a victorious king enthroned forever. The story we know reaches far beyond the little town of Bethlehem into every corner of the cosmos. Well, welcome to the hills. My name is Rick. I'm the senior teaching minister here. If you're watching online, if you're in person at West Fort Worth or Keller Campus or at North Richland Hills, if you're just listening to the podcast later, I want you to know that I have been praying for you, especially for this season that we are entering called Christmas. And I've been praying this will be the most unique, wonderful, and worshipful Christmas you have ever had. But before we look ahead, let's take just a moment and look back. If you're part of the Hills family, you know that three weeks ago in mid-November, we had our harvest offering. It's a one-time offering every year where we support our missionaries, our church planters. It's anything that we do to make Jesus famous locally, nationally, or internationally. And our goal was audacious, to raise $2.74 million. Well, church, I'm thrilled to tell you that just three weeks after that offering, we have reached our goal. We have raised $2.79 million. So we're $50,000 over our goal, and it will only grow. And every dollar will be used to share good news with the world that a Savior has come, a King has been born. And that's why I love to preach during the Christmas season, because it is the announcement of this good news that the one we all need has come. But here's one thing we know. If the narratives of the birth of Jesus teach us anything, it is that one can be in the presence of royalty and not realize it. Now, to illustrate that, I want to show you a video clip in a moment. This past year, perhaps the most momentous event was the death of Queen Elizabeth, arguably the most famous monarch in the world. There were many tributes to her. The one I think I enjoyed the most was by a man named Richard Griffin. He is a royal protection officer. And when the queen would go to Scotland to her vacation home, she loved to take hikes in the beautiful Scottish countryside. And Richard Griffin would walk with her for her protection. He tells a story of a certain hike, and along the way, they encountered two Americans on vacation who clearly had no idea whose presence they were in. I think you'll enjoy this. Please watch. And normally, on these picnic sites, you, you meet nobody, but there was two hikers coming towards us, and the queen would always stop and say hello. And it was two Americans on a walking holiday. And it was clear from the moment that we first stopped, they hadn't recognized the Queen, which is fine. And the American gentleman was telling the Queen where he came from, where they were going to next, and where they'd been to in Britain. And I could see it coming, and sure enough, he said to Her Majesty, and where do you live? <laughs> and she said, well, I live in London, but I've got a holiday home just the other side of the hills. <laughs> and he said, well, how often have you been coming up here? Oh, she said, I've been coming up here ever since I was a little girl, so over 80 years. And you could see the clogs thick. And he said, well, if you've been coming up here for 80 years, you must have met the Queen. I and as it. quick as a flash, she says, well, I haven't, but Dick here meets her regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy said to me, oh, you've met the Queen, what's she like? And because I was with her a long time and I knew I could pull a leg, I said, oh, she can be very cantankerous at times, <laughs> but she's got a lovely sense of humour. Anyway, the next thing I knew, this guy comes round, put his arm around my shoulder, and before I could see what was happening, he gets his camera, gives it to the Queen, and says, can you take a picture of the two of us? <laughs> anyway, we swapped places, and I took a picture of them with the Queen, and we never let on, and we waved goodbye, and then Her Majesty said to me, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when he shows us photographs to the friends in America. In the presence of royalty, and not even aware, and it happens every December. 
We buy our gifts, we sing our carols, we watch our favorite movies, and somehow Christmas gets reduced to being about our happiness instead of an acknowledgement that a king has come into our world. In fact, you often hear an expression this time of year, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Now, Christmas deserves many adjectives, but little is not one of them. Christmas is huge. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to explore just how cosmic Christmas truly is. And I'm not going to be saying anything new, but I think I'm going to be saying it in a new way. Because typically, when we study the birth of Christ, we go to the book of Matthew or the gospel of Luke, and we read their birth accounts. But today, we're going to go to John, not the gospel of John. We're going to go to the end of the Bible, a book we call Revelation, to understand just how cosmic Christmas really is. So you can follow along with me. I'm going to read from chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven shout, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of the Messiah. And then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Now, whatever else you can say about John's vision, it's clear he's not depicting a merry little Christmas. What he sees the hearse is a woman. And people say, does she represent Israel? Does she represent Mary? Does she represent the Old Testament prophecies? And the answer is yes. This woman is pregnant with messianic hope. And then he sees a dragon. None other than Satan himself, who is committed to preventing this Messiah from accomplishing what he has been born to do. But then you see God, who frustrates the devil and protects the one who is born to rightfully rule the nations. And then he sees a war. It starts in heaven, but it's being waged now on the earth. You see what Matthew and Luke give us in the birth accounts is how Christmas looked from earth's perspective. But what John is doing, he's telling the same story from heaven's viewpoint. He has taken us behind the curtain to see the events of Bethlehem the way the angels saw it. Because John knew that his readers then and now would benefit from realizing just how cosmic Christmas truly is. And that's because then and now, life can be really hard. And especially if you follow Jesus. You've got to remember, John is writing this letter from exile. He's on an island called Patmos. He has been tortured for his faith. He is writing to a persecuted church. 
People who are losing their jobs, losing their families, losing their freedom. Some are losing their lives. And what John does not do is say, hang on for a few more days and it will all go away. It's like the story of the pastor of the small country church announcing that he was moving to another church. He's at the back after church shaking people's hands and a sweet old woman walks up, tears coming down her cheeks. She grabs his hand and says, I am just so sad to hear that you're leaving. I don't know what we're going to do. And to comfort her, he says, I'm sure God will bring you a new pastor that's even better than me. And she shakes her head and says, they say that every time. It just keeps getting worse and worse. <laughs> that's what John is saying. Because he knows what these new Christians are thinking. They got baptized under this conviction that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Well, if Jesus is Lord, then why does it feel like Caesar is calling all the shots and in control of our future? And see, around the world today, Many Christians are entering the holiday season wondering the same thing. If Jesus is on the throne, why? If Jesus is on the throne, why has my cancer come back? If Jesus is on the throne, why did my parents get divorced? If Jesus is on the throne, why can't my child break free of their addiction? If Jesus is on the throne, why can't we get pregnant? Or let's think more nationally and globally. If Jesus is on the throne, why do little girls get kidnapped and murdered right here in our own community? If Jesus is on the throne, why do children get shot just going to school? Or neighbors get shot just going to Walmart. If Jesus is on the throne, why are little girls trafficked all over the world? And why are despots still in power of nations that oppress their own people and even attack and kill innocent people in other countries if Jesus is on the throne? And particularly as Christians, if Jesus is on the throne, then why are 10 Christians a day still getting martyred for their faith? Why do every day five Christians get kidnapped and just disappear? Why increasingly in our culture are people viewing us with hostility and anger for simply peaceably holding convictions Christians have held for thousands of years? If Jesus... He's on the throne. You see, John knows that what the church in every generation needs is a reminder of the unseen reality behind our seen reality. We need a glimpse of what is going on above us to help us deal with what is going on around us. We need to see how huge Christmas is. In fact, I would argue that heaven's perspective is indispensable. John's vision would suggest that the reason people despair is not because their problems are so big. It's because the narrative lens through which they are trying to interpret life is too small. Because the Kool-Aid of the culture and today is you've got to make your own meaning out of life. You've got to find your own truth. You've got to follow your heart. And the honest truth is the universe could care less about your tiny little story. It's too small to make sense of all the evil in the world. People need a meta narrative with which to understand life. And that's exactly what heaven's perspective gives us. Christmas says there is a big story getting played out. And you are part of this story, but you are not the main characters. The main characters are a dark Lord and a promised king. And they're in a conflict as the citizens of earth decide whose sovereignty they are going to recognize. And the story also acknowledges that right now the earth 
is dragon territory. There's a reason behind all the evil in this world and all the suffering and all the pain and all the horror. The dragon has been thrown to the earth. And he is behind all the principalities and powers that do these things, particularly to Christians. I remind you, the dragon especially is chasing the woman and her offspring. And we need to see what's going on in the unseen world. And we need to know what the dragon knows. Because the dragon knows the story will not end well for him. The dragon knows this child was not born to hold a rattle, but a scepter. The dragon knows who the true cosmic king really is. And John wants us to know it too. He wants us to remember that God's kingdom is invincible. And so do you notice, nothing the dragon does can stop the story from going the way God wants it to go. It's just one epic fail after another. The dragon wants to devour the child. He fails. The dragon wants to defeat Michael. He fails. The dragon wants to destroy the woman and her offspring. He fails. You see, when you see Christmas from heaven's perspective, it changes how we see what's going on in the earth. Revelation is calling on us to decide which one of these two rulers are we going to bow down to, to make it in a very hard world. And it reminds us only one kingdom has a future. And so when John says, I saw a child born to hold a scepter and rule the nations with an iron rod, he is pulling that right out of Psalm chapter two, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. The Holy Spirit inspired a song about this moment. Look at it with me. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off the shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son today. I've become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them like pieces of pottery. And so, what John was saying to those early Christians who were trying to decide, do we need to bow down to Caesar and call him Lord so that we can just survive and get out of what we're going through? And, and when, when Christians today ask the same questions, when the Caesars of any generation demand we put their agenda first, cosmic Christians say, nah, that's one of the holiest things you could say this Christmas. Turn to your neighbor and say, nah. <laughs> every other kingdom will be overthrown because every other kingdom is under a throne. And that's why we sing, you have no equal. You have no rival. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. The throne in heaven is always occupied and will never be threatened. So while the dragon creates all the hell he can on earth, he can do nothing to change how the big story is going to end. Now, I'll be honest. I can't tell you why God has put up with the dragon for so long. I've been praying for decades for Jesus to come back. I don't know how much longer God is going to put up with the dragon. I don't know when Jesus is going to return and banish the dragon from the earth forever. What I do know is that the one who was and who is and is always going to be is king forever. And so, 
Nothing the dragon or any empire can do will ever be able to exterminate the people of God and should not intimidate the people of God. As the psalmist said, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. And so cosmic Christmas is heaven's announcement to the prince of the world that his illegitimate reign has no future. But Jesus' reign is inevitable. You see, the birth of Jesus brought the rightful king to the earth right in the midst of dragon territory. And Christmas is calling us to reorient our life around this huge event. Listen again to what heaven said when Jesus was born. Verse 10, then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Now remember, John is writing to a persecuted church. He is writing to suffering people. He is writing to brothers and sisters in one kingdom under intense pressure to bow down to another kingdom in order to make it. And what they think they need is a revelation of why. But what John receives is a revelation of who. He's on Patmos. He's in exile. It's a Sunday morning. And he sees a vision. One like the Son of Man. His hair is white as snow. His eyes are like blazing fire. His face is burning like the sun. He speaks and it's so loud it sounds like flooding waters and a double-edged sword is coming out of his mouth. This is no Jesus meek and mild. This is Jesus, the cosmic king. And this is what he says. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is what Christmas is about. The acknowledgement of a cosmic king who conquered death and will rule all the nations. This is a Jesus that is big enough to reign in your suffering and through your suffering and after your suffering. Christmas in Revelation, Christmas from heaven's perspective is a rebuke to what I call pessimillennialism. Now everyone's got their view of Revelation. Here's mine. Stop being so afraid Stop despairing and stop putting your hope in the empires of men. We pray for our kings and our prime ministers and our presidents. But our ultimate allegiance is to the king of kings and our ultimate hope is in his return. And he is the answer to the suffering of the world. It's a vision of the absolute sovereignty of Christ. And the absolute futility of the dark Lord to prevent his inevitable universal reign. In fact, the dragon is a dead devil walking. And one day there will be hell to pay. The prophet saw this hundreds of years before Jesus. And Zechariah prophesied the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And on that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. And friend, let me tell you, when Jesus returns, no one is going to fail to realize that they are in the presence of royalty. Now that is the view 
the angels got when Jesus was born. And that is why in heaven they have never celebrated a merry little Christmas. We shouldn't either. So I want to close by showing you a work of one of my favorite artists. His name is Norman Rockwell. And you can see in this picture an ornate cathedral. And every square inch of this building was designed to point to transcendence and the glory of God, including the statues of the martyrs, the prophets, the apostles, and right in the center, the exalted Jesus himself. But look at the people. Their heads are down. You can see them trudging. You can see the weariness and the depression as they clutch their briefcases as if they were millstones. But we zoom in and we see that the pastor was trying to give his people an encouraging word. And so up on the sign, he has these words placed. Lift up thine eyes. And that's what I have been praying for you this Christmas. That you will not reduce this season to good food and shopping, and TV binging. This Christmas, you don't need better presents or fewer problems. You need a bigger view of Jesus. Jesus is bigger than whatever is making you afraid. Jesus is bigger than your Patmos. And Jesus is bigger and better than any other call for your allegiance. Remember that these next few weeks. And don't you dare settle for a little Christmas. In fact, here's my prayer for you. I've been praying that you would have an awful Christmas. Please notice how I'm spelling that word. That you would make time to sing some praises to the true king. That you would make time to ponder his immenseness. That maybe you would even make some time to get on the ground in his presence. My prayer is that you would have a merry, cosmic Christmas. Let's pray for that right now. And so, God, we enter into a season full of distraction. Protect us from that. Keep us, God, from the great temptation to celebrate the season and miss the king. Give us eyes to see how good he is. How mighty he is. How inevitable is his ultimate reign. And keep us from compromising with any other kingdom. We pray we can have a Christmas full of awe. And that our neighbors, as they witness the way we celebrate Christmas this year, will know that we believe in a bigger story. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.